Hi writers, thank you so much for this opportunity to come along and work with you on your abstracts for the work in progress conference uh, coming up at the end of the year or whatever other conferences it is that you might be preparing for. You might have some deadlines um, deadlines for disciplinary conferences or um, deadlines for other things that are coming up between now and WIP. So hopefully you're able to use this session in a way that's going to serve you. Uh, for those of you that don't already know me or don't know me formally. Uh, my name is Beck Wise. I'm a lecturer in professional writing here at UQ. I'm a specialist in rhetoric and writing studies. Uh, what that means is that I am, I am my area of special expertise is the way that we use writing and other forms of communication in order to do things in the world, to get our points across, to persuade people, um, to be convincing, to position ourselves as scholars. Um, uh, I work mostly in technical and professional writing as well as in academic writing. So what that means is that I'm really good at workplace genres and really good at academic writing like the abstracts you're going to be doing today. So in this video, I'm going to respond to um, several questions that the CAPS team um, put together um, in order to help you think about how you want to approach your abstract. You're going to be drafting one um, during the uh, during the writing group meeting on Wednesday and then I'm going to be coming in at the end of the session uh, to run you through a bit of a peer review workshop so you can practice assessing uh, abstracts which is something you are going to do in your careers um, as well as to get feedback so that you can help make your abstracts stronger before you submit them. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm just going to look up and down because I have the questions written down here for me. Um, so the first question was how should an abstract be structured? The good thing about uh, conference abstracts is that they are super, super formulaic. Um, article abstracts are pretty formulaic as well. They tend to have the same kinds of moves. Um, the most common structure that people recommend comes from a guy called John Swales, who is a linguist. Um, what he did was he studied actually the introductions to a huge number of uh, research papers. And what he found was that they always did the same three moves. And I'll run you through them. Um, what we've since found is that these moves work in introductions, but they also work really well in abstracts. And so they can be a really easy, almost a checklist for thinking about how you want to move through in the abstract and how you want to deliver, um, how, how you want to deliver the ideas that you're going to put forward in your abstract. So Swales calls this the CARS model, C-A-R-S, um, for creating a research space. Um, and he uses a kind of ecological metaphor um, with like, I toss up about whether it's colonial or not. It depends. Some people frame it in a way that sounds very colonial, but I think it's ecological. Um, he says that there are three uh, key moves that you need to make in um, putting together an introduction and, and an abstract. The first one is to establish a territory. So this is giving us that broad sense of what it is the abstract is about. This is your topic. Um, but it's also about what we already know about this topic. So it's about positioning your positioning yourself as a writer and a scholar within an existing field, um, within an existing field of scholarship. So here's what I'm talking about and here's what we already know about it. The second move is to establish a niche. Basically what you're trying to get across here is what's the exigence for your work? Why is it needed? What's the opportunity that you're capitalizing on? Um, so where is it that you are going to intervene in this conversation? The third one is to inhabit that niche, um, to be able to, to come in and say, look, this is how my work fits into this space that I've created. See, creating a research space. Um, so what you'll be doing in inhabiting that niche is saying, look, here is my specific intervention. Here is how it relates to what's already been said. Um, and here's what you can expect to walk away from. So generally speaking, that's um, the same kind of structure that you wind up using. Um, you use the very f first part of your abstract or your introduction to give the broad scope. So teaching, teaching your reader what it is you're going to be talking about, positioning it in the conversation, establishing the exigence for your work, and then saying what it is you're going to do. So the second question is, what separates a good abstract from a bad one? So I've written myself some notes here, and I'm going to run through them and think, uh, t tell you about why I think they matter. These are the things that I look for when I'm assessing abstracts. Um, 
I'm not going to say they're 100% universal, um, but I will say they're consistent with my experience reviewing abstracts across a couple different disciplines. Um, you know, I've, I work primarily in writing studies now. Um, this spans um, writing and English studies and also communication studies. Um, folks in my area tend to attend uh, conferences in both fields, um, as well as to read across both fields. Um, and also my experience reviewing in gender and cultural studies, which is where my master's, um, what my master's degree is in. Um, and I still review in that a little bit. Um, so I will run you through what I think. And then I'm also going to uh, run you through very briefly a set of reviewing criteria for one of my professional organizations, which is the Association for the Rhetoric of Science, Technology and Medicine, just so you can see what it looks like in that professional setting. Okay, so I have three key points here that um, that matter to me. Um, the first one is that it has to be plausible. Second one is it has to be engaged. And the third one is that it has to be detailed, um, which actually really like hooks into the other two um, and contributes to it seeming plausible and engaged. Um, so when I talk about plausibility, what I mean is, is this something that I can see you actually delivering on? Um, is it something that seems achievable in the time? It's wildly common for folks to, um, you know, in their first drafts to come up with an abstract or come up with a proposal that is a lifetime's worth of work um, or certainly a PhD's worth of work. Um, and I think you've all probably had that experience as you've been writing your prospectuses and writing your dissertations, uh, your theses, uh, depending where you are in your programs. People always, always start too big. You really got to carve it down to be something that's going to be achievable in your uh, 15 to 20 minute presentation, maybe less, depending on your conference. Um, and it also needs to be uh, feasible to do between like now and then. Uh, so, you know, um, either field work that's completed or doesn't need much field work it needs to be something that can be done. It also needs to be um, something where it all seems to hang together so that the topic, the methods and the proposed argument all seem aligned. So what, what we're looking for there is a sense that the methodology is appropriate to investigate the research question um, and that it can um, come up, that it, that it seems like it can come up with the real, with that answer and with that argument that you're previewing in your abstract. Second one is that your abstract needs to be engaged. Uh, so for me, what this means um, is that it's engaged along a few different axes. Um, the first one is that it needs to be positioned in a recognizable scholarly conversation um, so that I need to understand where it sits relative to the discipline. This is part of establishing the exigence. Um, it's about situating yourself in within the concerns of the discipline. For those of you that do interdisciplinary work um, and all of you who are pushing your disciplines forward, um, it may be, you, you're going to be doing maybe slightly novel things. You may need to explain how it's relevant to that scholarly conversation. That's normal, but it does need to be positioned in relation to what other scholars in the field are doing. Um, for those of you that are in uh, creative writing um, and who are doing practice led research, um, you should also be paying attention to the creative conversation that your work sits in. So doing that little bit of a contextual review, positioning it within that creative landscape. I generally look for um, these, these abstracts to also be engaged with the organisational priorities. Like does it align with the organisation's mission? Um, does it align with the organisation's um, scholarly focus? And here again is where you might be thinking about uh, those uh, those smaller and more niche conferences, not necessarily your big disciplinary conference. So writing studies, the Australasian Association of Writing Programs is the umbrella organisation, um, the umbrella conference for our field. Um, so you might be thinking about those big picture priorities. Or you might be going to a more specialist conference. So if I used to go to one called Gender Bodies Technology. It was kind of a feminist science studies um, conference. And so any abstract that I put in, I would need to align with those organisational priorities. Um, the third one is, is it engaged with the conference theme? So I do want to say this is like, 
it's not really mandatory. Um, a lot of the time you will, you will see this in conference programs, um, that people just put in the abstracts that they want to, um, and they don't, uh, even pay lip service to aligning with the conference theme. Um, in some disciplines, uh, conference themes are really not a big thing. So linguistics, for example, often does really short, um, conference themes that are just like discourse analysis. Is this about discourse? And you, you know, that's a pretty big bucket. Um, you don't need to work very hard to align your work with that. Um, whereas, you know, for the, uh, I've completely forgotten the work in progress, uh, theme for this year. So I am not going to say, give an example of that one. Um, so for one of my disciplinary conferences, um, at the Rhetoric Society of America, uh, this past year, uh, the overarching theme has been around, um, change and social justice. Um, the rhetoric of science, technology and medicine sub theme at that was around equity and global health. Um, and so I was, we did work to align our, uh, work with that theme. 100% people put in abstracts that don't align with the theme. That's normal. Um, a lot of the time they get through, especially for those big umbrella conferences and certainly for graduate conferences like work in progress, I would not expect that to be a deal breaker. Um, where there is a well-developed theme, if it came down to two equally, um, equally good abstracts, um, one of which had made an effort to align with the theme and one of which hadn't, I would probably go with the one that had um, tried to align with the theme. Um, so the reason this uh, question of engagement matters is that it, um, it helps to demonstrate how your work contributes to the field. Um, and it also helps to draw an audience, you know, people who are interested in similar ideas. Um, and the third thing that I look for in an abstract is a certain level of detail. Um, this is part of contributing to it to being plausible, right? Um, it helps to demonstrate that you have some sense of what it is you're going to do. Um, you need a level of detail that's going to make this attractive to a reader. If I'm putting together a conference program, like I don't want to program something that is so abstract and broad that audiences aren't going to know what to do with it. I want audiences to be able to make an informed decision and come to my panels. Um, it's not a competition, but it's kind of a competition. Um, and the other reason that, uh, making it detailed matters is actually not about uh, what it does for reviewers and audiences, but what it does for you as a writer. Um, because realistically you're writing, you're writing something that's a pitch for the conference organizers, but it's also a plan for you. Um, so you want to have enough detail in there for you to be able to open it back up in November or on the plane to the conference, or ideally not quite as last minute as that, you want to be able to open it back up and have that kind of, that kind of plan for what it is you're going to do, um, enough detail that you're not starting from scratch and reinventing your method and your results and your topic, well, you're not going to reinvent your results, obviously, but, um, enough so that you, um, can follow through on the promises that you've made. So those are my big three, plausible, um, engaged and detailed. Um, and then I do wanted to share with you, um, the reviewing criteria for, as I said, one of my professional um, my professional organizations, which is ASTEM. Um, so when we are asked to review, we have four criteria. Uh, the first of which is theme. Um, so as I said, one of these, this conference was, uh, global health themed. So the question was how well do the abstracts engage the pre-conference theme of global health as outlined in the CFP? So I've got the expectation in there that I'm referring back to the CFP. Again, I'm in a field with pretty detailed CFPs most of the time. The second one is fit. Um, and here they're thinking about the organizational fit. So do the proposals fulfill the mission of RSTEM to advance the study of theory and practice of the rhetoric of science, technology, and medicine? Third item there is content. Um, and what they're asking for here is um, kind of that detail, detail plausibility bit. Do the papers appear to be soundly structured, well argued and well written? It's a bit of a hypothetical because we all know that, you know, most of the papers are not written from these abstracts yet. Um, so does the abstract give the impression that all of those things are going to be true? 
So the abstract itself needs to have that kind of uh, clear structure, effective argument, argument, argumentative line, um, and that clarity, um, clear, comprehensible, written English. Okay, and uh, item number four is interest. Do the papers have potential to draw a substantial audience? This is especially critical for small conferences. Um, so ASTEM just does one day before a big, um, before the big conference, uh, Rhetoric Society. Um, and it doesn't have simultaneous sessions. They want these panels to be as widely applicable and widely interesting as possible um, because it is going to be the entire organization sitting in that one room for the entire day so that idea of is this going to be interesting to folks um, to everyone when they don't have other options uh, really matters um, and then just to kind of finally contextualize um, what we do with those criteria um, so for us um, we're always asked to comment on one or two strengths and one or two areas to be strengthened or considered. We don't, um, we, mm, okay, sometimes we share the reviewer feedback for people to help develop their papers. A lot of the time we don't. Um, that is not, yeah, that is um, common in that smaller org, but I mostly don't see it happen. Um, in the cultural studies, gender studies conferences I've attended. Um, it seems to be a bit specific to writing studies because we are writing nerds. We love to do this. Um, and it's certainly not going to happen at a large conference or a grad student conference. Um, you need to have that sweet spot of manageable size and high level of engage, high level of time and commitment. Um, yeah, so that feedback part. Um, is almost certain to just go to the conference organizers and not to the writer, which means you can be a bit direct. Okay, so next question. Do I need to know my full argument before I write the abstract? So I think you've already gotten a sense of my answer to this, um, just from the fact that I've said, I have to believe you're gonna have a full argument by the time we get to the conference. Um, you absolutely do not have to know your full argument, but we have to believe you're gonna have one. So you need to make it um, you need to make it plausible. You need to have that match between your topic, your method, and the results you're foreshadowing or the claims you anticipate making. You do need to have um, that sense of certainty that comes from pulling out all your hedging words like may indicate such and such or I will argue that. You need to um, come in sounding confident. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that you're writing a proposal. A proposal isn't a contract. Um, it is absolutely normal for folks' arguments and ideas to shift a little bit as you continue working on this paper um, and as your knowledge continues to evolve. You're always going to be integrating your prior and existing and emerging knowledge um, the whole way through your lives, but especially as you're working on a paper. Um, it's not a contract. Nobody is going to go back and look at your original proposal and be like, excuse me, Beck, you said you were going to talk about uh, building a technical communication uh, program at the University of New England, but instead you've come in here and you've talked about building one at the University of Queensland. No one is going to say that. Um, but you do want it to be kind of in the ballpark because they're going to use this to advertise your panel and your paper. Um, and they're going to use it to put you into those panels. So you want to make sure that you're sort of like in, you are kind of trying to do the same thing that you have um, put forward so that that panel is productive for you so that you get something out of meeting with these uh, other folks who are interested in the same topic or framework so that you'll get useful feedback from your audience who are there because they're interested in that specific thing. That's the goal. Sometimes things go completely off the rails and that's fine too, but you want to be in the ballpark. Okay, so next question. How do I show a gap in the literature without just listing what X and Y said? So this is actually a really complicated answer, um, which I, th yeah, this is a little bit complicated for a few different reasons. The first one is that even that idea of a gap 
um, a gap in the literature is a little bit difficult, right? Um, it's something that you hear all the time. You would have heard it in like every class in second year probably um, that a good research project fills a gap in the literature. In practice, that's not really the move that most academic writers are making. Um, it's not like there's just like a little hole that you can like slot things into. Um, I'm thinking of that TikTok where they're putting the shapes into the boxes. Um, you know, what shape, where does the, where does the square go? It goes in the square hole. Where does the circle cylinder go? And it also goes through the square hole as the, the girl gets like more and more distressed. Um, in practice, I think we all know that knowledge doesn't just like slot together, um, like putting squares into boxes. In practice, knowledge is kind of a complicated network. Um, and this is really reflected in how hard it is to show a gap in the literature because for starters, you can't prove a negative. You, you just, how, right? As you said, how, um, you, you might be wrong. I would personally never want to like come right in up and say in a proposal that I haven't actually done all the reading for yet. Absolutely. Nobody has done this ever because you might be wrong and your reviewer might know that. So I don't love it. Um, it's not great to kind of proceed from that deficit. Um, just kind of like mentally, I like to proceed from positives and strengths. Um, I hope you do too. And like I said, it doesn't align with what we know about how knowledge is produced, which is it's complicated. It's a network, um, ideas intermesh. There are multiple gaps. We weave things together in complicated ways. We could probably come up with like 18 different interconnected metaphors to explain this. The framework that I find helps um, is to move away from thinking about gaps and instead to think about um, spaces or opportunities or to take Swales' term from all the way up the top of the video um, is to take that idea of a niche. Um, because what we're trying to do, I'm just gonna decode this for you, when people talk about finding a gap in the literature, what they're really saying is you need to position yourself in that scholarly conversation relative to the other people that are talking about this topic, um, using these tools, um, applying these frameworks, um, building whatever, right? You're positioning yourself in that network. You'll be somewhere in that web. Um, and what you're trying to do in that showing the gap moment is to give that kind of roadmap for your reader. This is the landscape. This is where I am. So, um, yeah, so you're positioning yourself relative to other people. And the move is to establish the exigence for what it is you want to, what it is you're going to be doing. Um, and there are a lot of different reasons why expertise is needed. And it's not just filling in holes. Um, it's building on existing conversations. It is uh, drawing connections between different things. It is carving out a new little niche, pushing, pushing the discipline forward a little bit. Um, so thinking about what is it that makes your work necessary? What is it that you're contributing to? What is it that you're building on? Uh, where is it that you... Um, where is it that you're standing in order to do those things? So basically what I'm saying is you want to be thinking opportunity more than problem. So hopefully reframing it that way um, can help you think about how you position yourself and establish the exigence for your work. I do you have one other thing to say here, which is this is not just an abstract problem. Um, obviously, you know, it's the literature review um, comes up in relation to literature reviews as well. Um, but it's also something that comes up in a lot of other contexts, um, including professional contexts. So one of the stories I always like to tell around um, both uh, responding to difficult questions um, and reframing things to suit your goals is actually my interview for my job here at UQ. So when I interviewed, I was asked to do a 10 minute presentation and they sent me the topic and it was looking at the writing major or, or the graduate program in writing, editing and publishing, look at the major, identify a gap and then tell us how you'll fill it. And I'm guessing whoever wrote that was like, aha, yes, 
a, a fantastic scholarly genre. I looked at it and I was like, oh shit, this is a trap. This is bad. This is this is a trap. Um, because I don't have the insider knowledge to, like, it invites you to dunk on the existing program, right? It identifies, it invites you to find a problem and to dunk on it and then come in and save the day. And the problem with that is that when you dunk on something, you have no idea who's in the room or what their investment in it is. Like, do I really want to come in and say such and such element of the writing program sucks if the person that designed that element is the one in the room? They're probably not going to like it. They're probably not going to be receptive to what I have to say. Um, so I did not want to come in and say, here's the gap. Here's the problem. But I could absolutely see some opportunities I could see some opportunities to build on the existing strengths of the program. Um, and, you know, speaking directly, speaking to you all um, in this confidential unlisted uh, YouTube video, um, you know, absolutely I could see a gap. You know, I'm in professional writing. They were hiring me for professional writing. There is one professional writing class. There is a clear opportunity to add more and to extend the program in that area, right? I could call that a gap for sure, but I can also reframe it to better serve my purposes um, and to make more sense to how I approach the world and approach the job um, and to what we know about how programs are built, knowledge is built. So make it work for you would be my advice. Okay, uh, next question. Um, should I include citations in an abstract? Put another one where it's complicated. In this case, it's discipline specific. So what you're going to need to do is either to ask a trusted mentor in your field, if you have time and a mentor. Um, if you don't, then I would say jump online and pull up the conferences, pull up the um, programs for the conferences in your field, whether it's the previous conference that you're applying for, or whether it's just kind of the big disciplinary conferences to get a sense of the the um, the approach that people use. Most conferences will have the full abstracts available online somewhere, you, especially if you go back a couple years um, to when they were all being done as PDFs rather than extremely buggy single-use apps. Um, you should be able to abs enter, access the full set of abstracts to get yourself a genre model. So it's discipline specific. I will just sketch out a couple of common approaches to including citations and to crediting other scholars in your work. Um, so for some disciplines, the answer is just no. Just do not include citations. We don't expect to see uh, other people's names in it. We just want to see your contribution. Um, some places, they want to see you name drop. Um, either highly recognizable people or highly recognizable frameworks without giving a formal citation. So if you are, um, you know, if you are going to a feminist science studies conference, then you can just name drop Donna Haraway without really needing to go into it further, um, without needing a formal citation, without needing um, to include a bibliography. Maybe you would just refer to the person. Maybe you would refer to a specific text. But basically a, a kind of drive-by name drop as part of positioning yourself within a scholarly conversation. Um, some, some places will look for a kind of mini lit review, which is basically just a string citation um, where you're just listing off the names of like three other key people that have worked in this area or... Um, whose work you're, you're engaging with. So again, it's just a really quick drive-by because you're only talking about 250 words, right? Um, so, um, for example, you know, if I were uh, writing an abstract for, what's the next one I have coming up? Um, okay, so I was writing a, an abstract for National Communication Association. I might say something like, you know, my work... Uh, responds to calls by scholars like Donny Saki, um, Rebecca Walton, and um, Kara Adachakyak um, for greater engagement with uh, non-Western and community-oriented rhetorics of science. Just a drive-by. 
Um, and the last option is that some places will ask you for an indicative bibliography. Um, this is the one place where I will say, yes, we want to see a list of things you haven't read. Um, so you'll have your regular abstract and then a list of sources that you anticipate drawing on in the full paper. Um, people that want that will always say it in the CFP. So that's not one to like reach for when you're unsure. Uh, for the for the WIP conference, it, they don't specify. Um, it really doesn't matter. So think of this as an opportunity to practice whatever is most common in your field so that you can develop some phrases and structures that uh, make sense for you as a writer um, and align with their practices in your field. Okay, this was, um, this was the last question I was given. I have some bonus advice I'm going to include. Um, and really it was kind of a tough one. So I was asked for three useful phrases and three phrases to avoid. And writing my notes for this took longer than for any of the other um, items on here. Because um, I was kind of thinking about, you know, well, yeah, I got it in my head. You know, what is it that works for me in my field? What is it that I'm trying to achieve with these phrases? Um, but... Anyway, so I have gone ahead and uh, come up with three of each, but tough question. Okay, so um, my first useful phrase I have put in here responds to. Um, basically what, I'm, what I was thinking about here was what are the phrases that I go to um, that help to simultaneously give kind of my purpose and my position in the field. So I was thinking about um, my work responds to recent calls for X or it responds to the need for something. Um, so positioning it as part of a conversation and then using that as a transition into a claim about the exigence. So response to. Um, I am being a little bit dodgy here. Um, but one word marker words. So basically what I'm thinking of is things like nevertheless or therefore the single word things that help you to identify relationships between ideas and sentences. Um, so instead of saying it thus follows that blah, 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 one word, therefore X. Uh, and my third useful phrase is not so much a phrase as it is an orientation to the work, which is use the first person. First person writing, first person, um, uh, first person writing is acceptable in all humanities and most social sciences. Um, and it is even more acceptable in a conference abstract than it is in uh, articles and books. Use the first person. It is clear. It is direct. It makes you seem agential um, within your abstract. Um, it saves words because it is less words to say, I will argue that. Or better, I argue that. More on this later. Um, I argue that is three words compared to it will be argued that. Five. If you use an active voice first person throughout, you, I mean, it's not going to be like a 40% reduction in words, but it's going to be a substantial reduction in words, which matters when you have a very small word count. So use the first person. Uh, my three to avoid. Number one, we'll argue that. I hate it. I hate it. Um, the reason that I hate I will argue that is first that it's needlessly wordy. Um, and the second one is that it suggests... Like it's it's a bit uh, it's a bit hedgy it's a bit tentative, um, it makes it seem like you don't one hundred percent know what your paper well you know what your paper is going to be about but like you haven't done it yet. Um, I always always say just right I argue that it makes it seem like it's all set and done and again it saves you a word which is always good. Um, words to avoid gap, I really really hate gap. I don't, I don't love it. Um, and I've given you some versions of that. And the other phrase that I, yeah, is a real bugbear for me. And it's another one that just like, it doesn't serve a purpose within an abstract in particular. 
um, stuff like it, it is important to note that or it should be noted that especially in an abstract, you wouldn't be telling us if it weren't important, right? You've got 250 words. Are you going to waste your time telling us something that's not important? No, you get, it's, it's there because it's important. So just tell us the thing. You don't need to um, give us that big, big wind up at the beginning to demonstrate that it's important. Its presence here demonstrates that it's important. Um, this also means that you can like bring your points up to the, t the front of the sentence rather than burying them in the middle. Um, you're writing for a time poor reader. They're going to be skimming this um, in order to, you know, your reviewers might spend a bit of time with a like, yes, no, um, depending on the feedback levels that they're being asked to give. Um, for some conferences, it will just be the organizer skimming through it and saying, yes, no. Yes, I can see that in this panel. Um, so using those really direct sentence structures, bringing the main point of your sentence to the front to make it easy to skim um, is can be really helpful in getting your paper accepted and getting it put on the kind of panel that you want to be on. Okay, so that's all the CAPS questions. Um, I do also have some like a little bit of bonus advice, um, which is that, you know, I know that you're coming into the session with a concrete goal. Um, I know that you're coming here to try and write your whip uh, abstracts, um, but I do want to kind of gesture out towards some of the larger contexts of this advice. You know, this is obviously stuff that you can use to, um, you know, to write successful abstracts for a range of different contexts, um, for pitching to special issues, um, for conferences outside of UQ. Um, you know, there might be something that you might use in like a proposal genre um, more broadly. So I've kind of approached it from what, what it is that makes a successful abstract proposal in terms of getting into a conference. But I also want to encourage you to think about how you can use these abstracts and use these papers um, to extend your professionalization in different ways. Um, how is it that you can make this um, this process of drafting your abstract work for you in other contexts? And also, how can you make this abstract really work for you um, and do more than just being ticking off the whip box um, for your progress through your degree? Um, so I really want you to encourage you to think about this as kind of a broader professionalization opportunity as well, um, to be able to think about how, how can you apply this kind of uh, writing skill to other genres, to other contexts, like, you know, job interviews. Um, where is it that you run into these in other forms of writing that you're doing, like your lit review, how can you use it there or your introduction or whatever? Um, and I also want you to think about what it is that is going to make this paper, when you're deciding what it is you want to do in this abstract, what is it that's going to make this paper successful for you? What else are you going to get out of it? So um, this might be that you just need it to give you kind of a deadline for a chapter you've got to write or an article you've got to get out the door. Um, when I have something I'm having trouble getting through, I often propose it for a conference because then I have a deadline, you know, I have some pressure. Um, keep in mind that conferences are places where that are intended to be conversations, not, not just presentations. So they're intended to be places where you can get feedback on early work. Um, if I'm working on something that I'm just like, I just, I'm like a little bit unsure of it's preliminary. I'll often try and do that as a conference presentation because it puts you in a room of folks who are interested in an expert in it, which means that you can get feedback early on, get that formative feedback that can help you to make this, um, this project or this line of argument uh, stronger and more effective. Um, and the other thing you might be thinking about here is, well, what is it that this event is going to serve as? Um, in particular, I would say think about um, think about your panel and your audience um, as folks that you're going to continue to work with. Um, this can be an opportunity to identify collaborators. It can be an opportunity to reach out to collaborators, um, especially for those of you that are um, coming towards the end of your programs in like your second and third years. One thing you might be thinking about is um, 
is starting to hook into broader networks around the field. Um, thinking about putting together a panel, not for WIP, but for your disciplinary conference um, that brings together people from other institutions that you want to network with, that you can imagine collaborating with. Um, thinking about using it to connect with senior scholars. So I often suggest like put together a panel and ask someone senior to come in and be a respondent or to present with you. Um, just as part of kind of getting your name out there, establishing your reputation for your area of specialization um, so that, you know, when, I mean, it's like identify, it's establishing your brand, right? Making yourself recognizable and legible in the field. So have a think about what it is that this paper can do for you. Sometimes you have a paper that's just like one and done and that's fine, but I think we all have better time things to do with our time than to have something that's just a write-off. So there you go. That's my advice. <laughs> Don't panic. Never panic. Um, you just need to make it believable. Be direct. Be clear. Be specific. Be part of your community. And also have fun. Um, so I hope, I hope this has been helpful. Um, I am going to be happy to do a little bit of Q&A when I come in to do your do the peer review bit with you towards the end of um, your writing group session. Um, I, I've carved out an hour, so I'll be there 3.30 to 4.30. I do need to leave after that to get my head in the game for my class that meets at 5. Um, but yeah, happy to... Yeah, do a bit of Q&A as well as facilitate that review activity so you can practice reviewing um, and get some feedback so you can revise your paper, your abstract, make it better, get accepted um, and live happily ever after. See you soon.